Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm responsible for the research in the faculty, which includes the things you're doing, although it's run much more day to day um, with all the detail by Jackie and her colleagues. So I'm really pleased to be here and see such a lively audience. I should also say that Laura Watt, who isn't able to join us today, also uh, completed her PhD in CMIST um, and, and sociology. So we do have a very good engagement and way of bringing people's uh, careers forward. And I'm sure Helen will be able to uh, say more about that if, if you're interested in the what next steps. What we're going to do to start with is show you about six minutes of a 15 minute film. The whole film uh, is available and will be available through the link afterwards. It was a film made a couple of years ago in the School of Social Science about the range of research we do connected to gender relations and gender inequalities. So you'll spot a few faces. A couple of people have since moved on and up to other universities. Hairstyles have changed, people have got older, but the debates remain the same. Um, and our research is located within this broader uh, range of activities um, that colleagues are engaged in, and I suspect, simply on probability, some of you in the room are doing something connected, if not to gender inequalities, to inequalities research more broadly. So, Helen's going to link us through, and uh, we'll leave you to it for this bit. Feminism has a long history and different roots in different bits of the world. But if we talk about the UK, the first mobilisation really was to get the vote, the suffragettes who were from Manchester. Track forward through First and Second World War, where there were different mobilisations around women because a lot of men were off at war and suddenly we needed people to do the paid work. So things started to change, and then the next landmark would really be what was often called first stage feminism around the civil rights movement, where there was a push post-war that the world can be a better place, and there was movements around women's rights, gay rights, black rights across the world. The research that we do at Manchester University is about finding ways to empower women in terms of politics but also financially so that they've got equal rights before the law but also equal capacity to take up their rights and actually enact their rights. There's been a lot of positive change if I think the conditions my grandmother grew up, the conditions and expectations my mum had. Lots of things have changed and improved, some have got worse. What's becoming more apparent recently is how prevalent gender inequality and sexism is, even in the lives of young women. And so I think that those debates are becoming enlivened again. We tend to go into different kinds of jobs and by some weird coincidence, the kind of jobs most women do are paid less. The gender pay gap has already widened and we can expect to see it widen further. It's not fair to say that everybody's on an equal playing field, that everybody's got equal access to work because they don't. The Women's Budget Group have gathered to watch the Chancellor uh, deliver his budget speech and uh, then develop some ideas of our reactions to it and craft a press release. The Women's Budget Group brings two issues together which are normally looked at separately, which is macroeconomics and gender issues. It brings them together to the core of the discussion. We do this every budget and when we do this, it's quite a good opportunity for us to draw together our expertise, to, um, to really think hard about what the direction is for gender equality in this country and to try and come up with some solutions for how to make women's lives better. We are able to see who will be the disadvantaged ones and who are vulnerable to certain decisions. 
It's really interesting coming to a meeting like this, where you have people around the table talking about policy, about, about what feels to me like abstract economics a lot of the time, when really the work that I do is on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing people living through austerity. It's, like I said before, the lived experience, what it means uh, to, to cope and to consume in times when things are being cut for, for most hard-working uh, families. Women are more prone to poverty than men at all stages of their lives because they earn less money. They have to use a lot of money to cover the cost of childcare or caring for elderly relatives. And this is becoming increasingly expensive for them because a lot of the public services that existed to support um, people with caring responsibilities have been cut. And what we also know is that if women don't have adequate incomes, it makes them vulnerable in a lot of other ways. So they might be less able to leave violent or abusive relationship. The deficit is down by a third. Now in the coming year it will be down by a half. The Chancellor will say there's a record number of jobs being created um, in the economy. Well that might be the case but actually when you break it down and see well who's getting these jobs, what the Women's Budget Group has found is that actually more of these jobs are going to men than they are to women. Women are concentrated in low paid jobs, zero hours contracts, pay restraint in the public sector, where so many women are employed, the so-called flexible labour market that all seems to be flexibility that benefits the employers. The Chancellor said nothing about public services, just business as usual, more austerity for the public services, even though the economy is growing again. What he talked about was lots of tax giveaways. The people who will benefit most from those kind of measures are higher income men. If we don't do meetings like this, I think the voice of many groups in society wouldn't get heard because not everyone is represented in the relevant decision-making forum. So it's important that it's being discussed. I'd really like to say that I'm positive about the future, but from the families that I've been working with in the project I'm doing now and the families that I've worked with over a couple of years before, I don't think that, that it really is a feeling of being positive, that actually people are fearful of their own future and the future for their children. The Women's Budget Group, they do serve as an inspiration globally. And for me, <laughs> the work became an inspiration to do something similar in Macedonia and to initiate it through my work and also independently as an person who is a gender advocate. This research is really important because we're trying to achieve a closing of the gap, the gender equality gap between men and women. What I would like to see is men and women having equal incomes, but also like to see women having equal access to avenues of power. Equal representation is really important for gender equality and for the quality of democracy. So if you want to watch the full film afterwards, you will see a couple of people on it uh, with the organisations we work with, uh, notably Working Families, which I'm going to come on and talk about. So within that wider frame, the particular research that we do and we're going to talk about today are around gender inequalities in employment and all the unpaid stuff that comes in households to keep us all functioning, to keep society functioning um, and in particular we're going to focus on men and dads. So our research background is in the context of doing European comparative research, seeing how things are organised differently in different societies, how policy frames shape our behaviour and reflect and shape our attitudes and expectations around gender roles. Um, and it's also informed uh, one of the ref impact cases for sociology. So I've put the link up there if you want to see some of the, the wider things and the backstory to the things we're talking about today. So we're going to do a joint presentation. I'm going to start by introducing the project, the Project Genesis, this particular project, which uh, Helen is the principal investigator on talk about working families who are our non-academic partner um, and how we built a relationship with them, which was both a condition of the award, but we wanted a relationship and partnership with them anyway because we'd been having conversations about the synergies between their policy um, engagement and agendas and our research agendas and the benefits that um, dialogue can create to both. 
We'll talk a bit about our pathway to impact that we designed as part of the condition of applying for ESRC funding. And Helen will then pick up and talk about how to communicate, in our case, both very statistically quantitative material, which is an incredibly valuable method, but doesn't always speak very easily to a, a, a non-academic audience, or indeed to many academics, when you start talking about coefficients, et cetera, et cetera, it can switch people off if they don't understand the technical language and how you get beyond that and get the key messages through, as well as the qualitative angle of the research which um, our colleague Laura Watts is driving. So the project Genesis, uh, well, it came out of work we'd started to do on men's care roles either as care workers, nurses, elderly care assistants, primary school teachers and so forth, or their unpaid work in the home. Sorry guys, you may or may not already be aware of that, but even when you do a full-time job and you have a full-time employed partner, somehow you're still not pulling your weight at home in terms of the number of hours you do looking after the kids, doing the housework. There's a whole history behind that, and it is changing. Younger generations of men are showing a bit of a change, and we want to see it carry on through life. But it's also shaped in different societies in quite fundamental ways. So if I just use the example of parental leave availability, the most generous, and I think appropriately generous, conditions are available in the Nordic countries, particularly Sweden, where the parental leave entitlement of fathers is longer than the maternity leave entitlement of women in many European countries, including the UK, certainly on a paid basis. Um, men still take fewer days of parental leave, even within societies which have a campaign and a resource base to encourage it, but the average Swedish dad spends longer at home with his newborn than a professional woman in the US, France or the UK. So you can see how behaviours and relationships with our kids can be shaped by policy intervention in very powerful ways. We're not going to talk about how these policies come about, campaigns, attitudes, history, all the stuff that shapes how societies are different, but that was our starting point for thinking about what was happening in the UK, and particularly when the UK moved very reluctantly to introduce unpaid parental leave, and very reluctantly into a very complicated shared parental leave policy package which we have in place now in the UK, and which organisations such as Working Families are trying to get to really stick and have impact in organisations. Helen was completing her PhD, supervised by myself and Mark Elliott in CMIST, and that added further momentum to the debate, and Helen addressed a number of these issues in her thesis, and there were a number of publications which have come out of that, and a couple of blogs and so forth. So the actual project is an ESRC-funded project for early career researchers uh, premised on quantitative data analysis. It was a secondary data analysis initiative. Um, the details are up on the slide, and um, I, I won't dwell here, but the essence of what we were trying to do, what we are trying to do, because we're still doing it, is what influences father's involvement in childcare at different points in child's life and we're going up to eight, eight years, 11 years, tracking through using the Millennium Cohort Survey from nine months at birth, what dads are doing, through to what are they doing by the time the child is 11 years. So it's a really rich data set. We can do lots of other longitudinal things as well as parental activity. We're also looking at whether the behaviour, what the parents do in the first year of the child's life affects the father's behaviour later. So here's the policy hook. If the father spends time at home during the first year of the child's life, whether on parental leave or just because he decides to do so, does this shape how he's involved in caring for his child at 5, 8, 11 years and the quality of that relationship and indeed the quality of the relationship with the parents and the impact of this on the stability of the, um, the relationship, whether it's marital or cohabiting. So those are the big questions from a policy and a theoretical angle that we wanted to address. 
There are three key design elements of the project that we're focusing on today for the discussion, although Helen and I will be happy to talk about other parts of it um, in Q&A if people are interested. The first was building a project partnership with working families, which we'd already started. We knew a couple of people there. We'd already overlapped in a number of ways. And this agenda really spoke to things they were grappling with and still are. Um, we're also going to talk about how we, right through from PhD onwards, grappled with how you can effectively communicate your results, whether it's a 10-minute pitch at a large international conference where you can't put all your statistics up and debate the nuances of the coefficients and heterogeneity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to get your methods across and assure the audience that the data does stack up. Um, and that's particularly complicated with some forms of data sets. Quants don't have the monopoly on complexity. Qualitative-based research also needs to be able to explain concisely and persuasively why they're doing it, why it's important, and why the data is valid. But it involves a different set of tools when you're in a, a short elevator pitch at an academic audience, or indeed trying to engage a busy policy person to listen to you and pick up your ideas. Um, and we're also going to talk about the qualitative research element of it um, that Laura's been leading on. There's a project site on CMIST um, where you can see more of the detail and connect through to some of the outputs um, as, as they're posted. So, working families. If you watch the whole film, you'll see a lovely shot of Jonathan Swan talking about who's the research and policy officer of working families, who um, talking about the agenda around involving dads. Um, working families is a key organisation in the UK policy and lobbying area. University of Manchester's affiliated organisation, and it's dedicated to moving forward policies to enhance what's called work-life balance, basically the fit between the demands of jobs and the demands of family, and the pleasures in both domains as well. It's not just onerous work. Um, if you've got a good job, you get a lot of satisfaction from it. And most people, for most of the time they're in families, get a lot of satisfaction, even if there's challenges in making it all work together and pleasure. And it's rare that at the end of life someone will say, oh, I wish I'd spent more time in the office or moving my career on. It's normally the point of reflection is, what are your relationships with your family? Did you do it right? So what they do is a number of very practical things. They run helplines, um, advising parents and carers. They conduct research and run campaigns, and that's where we come in as part of their research, research partnership. And they support and advise employers about what to do based on research evidence and based on the constituency of information they get from parents and carers, unions, etc., and others. Examples they see of how it's worked in other sectors or other countries. I knew working families um, on and off through a number of more uh, tangential engagements. We'd met at conferences. Um, I'd used their work. They'd used a bit of mine. Um, and we were involved in an ESRC seminar series run with a number of universities. And Working Families was one of the regular partners and attendants, along with Trade Union Congress, the Quality Human Rights Commission, and a number of others. Um, and uh, in the film, you will see some snippets um, of it, because we had one of the six events up in Manchester, which, which Helen organised beautifully. Um, the conference is finished. Be, sorry, the seminar series is finished. The book's come out. Jonathan has got a contribution in it, and there's a, a chapter from myself, and also Greet Vermeulen from Eurofound, which is a European organisation working on similar agendas, who's also in the film. And it was in the space of this two-year collaboration that we started to have a discussion about our plans for follow-on work and how they might or might not connect with Jonathan and his colleagues at Working Families. None of this is rocket science. Um, it may do nothing more than simply reassure you that your plans are exactly on course and there are no hidden tricks. Um, 
we found it useful to reflect because we've learned as we went along. Certainly when I started my academic career, there was no expectation, but you really got your message out beyond the academic audience. So I did it really by trial, desire, and error, and just an interest in having my ideas heard more widely. Um, so we boiled it down to some of the key things which are important. And many of these actually resonate with negotiating access when you're doing field work anyway. Persuading other people to engage with you, give up their time, their energy and ideas, but you are worth talking to and you're not wasting their time or going to use their ideas in a way that is damaging to others. So, ideas pitch. This is simply, we started talking to Jonathan and we started um, simply having a conversation um, which built to a more formal pitch, really, about what our ideas and plans were, why we thought it was relevant to working families, and also reassuring from an early stage we weren't asking for big bucks. We wanted some resource, but we weren't going in and asking them to fund, because that's often the first gatekeeper. Sounds interesting, but if I spend too much time, they're going to hit me with an unrealistic resource demand. So it's getting that balance right at the start. Um, and so our conversations built to a more formal meeting, where we went down and met Jonathan in London and set some dedicated time aside to talk to him. One of the key things to do here, which if you've had to negotiate access in your studies, you may have already had dry runs with supervisors, is getting the tone and the language right quickly. Not a really long access letter of why you're doing something really, really important and somebody should engage, but using a language which um, really gets through and engages and cuts to the point. Um, so, for example, the language we didn't use was we want to test a hypothesis of the concept of parental involvement in wave one of the Millennium Cohort Survey because if Jonathan had gone, oh, that sounds interesting, I would have worried about his credibility or how he communicates elsewhere. What we did say was we want to find out which dads are more involved in looking after their kids and what policies can do to help more dads follow on and do this. And that's the language that makes the connection and our concepts and our theories and our methods are backstage because Jonathan doesn't want to know about that, certainly not in the first pitch. We then explored points of connection and that's where you've got to have a little bit of give and take um, because they'll want to have, if it's a partnership, there's some shaping. And so we adapted a little bit about thinking, not so much how we would fundamentally change the agenda of what we wanted to do, but how we could build in other things, additional briefings, which weren't core to our work, for example, but stuff we needed to know to do our work, and Jonathan needed to be able to get out and engage. Um, and so, for example, in December, we're doing a breakfast briefing for employers in Manchester, which draws on some of our other research, as well as the new research, because that's what will be useful for working families to, to get out and engage with. So the obvious points of connection for us and Jonathan were around the bullets which were on the, the PowerPoint, and I, I'm not going to run through them now. So what were the lessons, or what is the, uh, the checkpoints um, that we've, we've boiled down? It's quite simple, but you have to allow time to do this, and sometimes you have to practice your skills of elevator pitch, which isn't always a natural thing for academics. We like to do the long explanation with our long words and our caveats about what the research may or may not mean in different contextual settings. Hold that back a little bit, at least until the relationship is up and running. Do the groundwork, identify who it is you want to partner with or a set of partners. We approached others, we wanted to have two partners, Quality and Human Rights Commission, We've got really a very long track record. I used to work with them. Helen's had an internship there, but they're too busy because everybody in the world is asking them to partner. So they step back on this and that's perfectly fine, but um, not everyone is going to come to fruition. Um, and it's about building those relationships and time and being able to separate without feeling uh, you've been let down. Uh, make the initial approach. Um, it's much easier through networks and conversations than the cold call. It's not impossible, but for the cold call, you've got to get past busy gatekeepers often to get to the real decision maker. So it needs to be lively, succinct. All the stuff you may have studied or put into practice, setting up your own field work if you've done field work. Um, and you've got to have your ideas pitched. Succinct, engaging, why it engages you, why it's going to engage them, why it's going to be valuable. 
Um, and your ideas alongside the relevance to the organisations that are representing the interests you want to engage with. Your initial plan, it can be tentative, but the audience won't often know the scale, even fundamentals, like is it an 18 month, is it a three year, is it going to be a study in Manchester, is it going to be nationwide, have you got an American partner? The nuts and bolts for an audience who are used to engaging and project planning at different scales and in different ways, you need to spill out. And the sort of the trickiest bit is the resource. So our conversation with Jonathan was, we're going to apply for funding, um, it will be of this scale. We won't be able to put any funding into your organisation because that's the nature of it. Um, we're not going to ask you for money, but what we would really like is to be able to give you information that you can launch through your website, come along and contribute to some of your events. We're happy to do roundtables, etc., etc. And we'd like some of your time, Jonathan, as an advisor on the project. So those are all the resources. And it was a manageable ask for him. And actually, they were much more generous than we expected them to be able to do. But we weren't saying, give us 100 grand and we'll do a project for you, Jonathan. So that kind of conversation needs a bit of rehearsal and practice, um, particularly if you're, if you're new to doing budget negotiations. And to be flexible, to refine and adapt without compromising your project and to work through what you can add in, but also where the boundaries are that you're not prepared to go over or you're not in a position to for this particular project to transcend, whether it's research questions, nature of the design, uh, nature of the collaboration. And to work through your pathway to impact. Now, this is where we had quite a lot of iteration with Jonathan, very helpful to work out what we could feasibly do that would be relevant to them within the confines of the funding um, call from the ESRC and also that would tick the boxes, and I don't just mean in an instrumental way, but would really show the value of the project to the ESRC peer review college when they were looking at whether or not to fund it. So our starting points, thinking about our pathways to impact, well, is, well, why is the research important? Not just for the knowledge base of social science, but to travel and have reach beyond academic debates. And these were the claims we made um, and the claims we stick to. If we do our job right, this is where we will have impact. That we're aiming to inform policy debates about parenting, child well-being and development, and the rights and well-being of fathers and the so-called work-life balance debate in families. But through doing so, we're going to contribute to employment policy and workplace innovation. Is shared parental leave working? Is the right to request flexible working working? How is this panning out in the current period of still post-austerity? Um, what can organisations and governments do to improve the conditions in which shape parents' decisions and so forth? And at a practical level, through working families and their direct work with employers to look at organisational practices and to allow the leading edge innovators to set standards which can then spread out to other companies and organisations through innovation. Our pathway to impact, this is really a summary of what we did for the um, application and is now literally part of our work program that we track as we, as we move through, not just where are we up in terms of delivering the data and our writing schedule, but are we on track for our pathway stage deliverables of um, action? Um, we used the Knowledge Exchange and Impact team to help us work this up. There's one in every uh, research support hu service hub to help with funding applications. Um, and the, this is the offer we are committed to making, and this will be part of the measure of whether we've succeeded when we get to the end of award report to the Economic and Social Research Council. We promised a set of policy briefings and blogs. They're not out yet, they're in the pipeline. Um, we've planned our presentations over the next three years, not just for the academic conferences, although we've got our, our diary list coming up, but also for non-academic events. And I've just trailed the December event with uh, Working Families Breakfasts, engagement with employers. Um, we'll be doing something at their annual conference in April. So a roundtable taster of our 
uh, research and general engagement about dads and parental leave and childcare and all that stuff. Um, we're doing some related briefings for working families, which aren't directly related to the project, but they are interested. So um, updates on things happening in Europe, which we know about through other research activities, and we'll just be feeding in and giving them a research base to communicate, um, which is really helpful for us because it keeps us up to date with other stuff and helps us draw the connections, but isn't technically part of the project from the ESRC. And we've also got a commitment to disseminate beyond working families, some of which is going to be a bit more difficult now we're in the middle of Brexit in terms of getting access uh, to some of the European organisations, but we're, we're confident we can do it based on, on networks, um, press releases and um, targeted articles for trade and media. Okay, so for my part of the talk, I'm just going to draw um, on one part of the analysis that we've been doing for our um, ESRC project in order to illustrate how to present and communicate fairly complicated quantitative mod models and results to non-academic or, or practitioner audiences. So, this um, I'm just going to give you quite a quick overview of the data um, and um, give you some, some key findings. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but if you are interested, we do have um, some papers published um, reporting this. But just, just very briefly, uh, this part of the analysis uh, looked at what influences paternal involvement at age three. And for this analysis, we used two sweeps of uh, the Millennium Cohort Study, which is a nationally representative um, study following a cohort of children born around the year 2000 in the UK. For this, we used two sweeps of data. The first sweep was when the child was aged nine months old. The second sweep, the child was aged three. And for this analysis, our sample was just over 9,000 households that included a, a father and a mother who were intact over those both sweeps of data. So for this analysis, our, our dependent variable of father involvement um, was a binary variable, and it was derived from a question, who is mostly around and generally looks after the child when they're age three? From that, we identified two categories of fathers. Dads that share childcare roughly equally with a partner, who we call our involved dads, and fathers that do less, who are the secondary caregivers. Just to note, fathers that do the most, who only make up a very small proportion of the sample, 1%, were actually removed from the analysis because a separate analysis showed they were very different to fathers who shared childcare, so we couldn't just lump them into one category. Um, the method that we used was logistic regression. So we're trying to predict whether fathers share childcare or whether fathers do less. Okay, what did we find? So, <laughs> this is not actually my work. I'm plagiarising this. This is actually taken from a very interesting academic paper by Sarah Connolly et al. in Work, Employment and Society on Parents and Employment. And I'm no way criticising this as a presentation of data, generally in a journal article. It's, you know, a very beautiful table and everything. But I'm just using it to illustrate a point about presenting data to an audience. So my question to you is, is this clear? Um, will your audience understand this slide? And more importantly, do they need to know all of, all of every single bit of this data? First of all, it's really important to know your audience and present data and information accordingly. Think about whether your audience is academic, are they practitioner, or is it a mix of both? Unless you're presenting data to, say, the Royal Statistical Society, where you perhaps you need to mention some of the finer details here, generally, academic and or practitioner audiences don't need to know about every single beta, standard error, confidence interval. If somebody in the audience does ask about this, well, it's um, an opportunity to direct them to the publication. Uh, so there's a bit of a handy advert there for you. Even if you do come, come across um, a presentation that does present a complicated table like this, the speaker is not going to go through and scrutinise every single figure. They tend to just focus on the key me um, messages, the significant results anyway. So you need to think about what the key messages are, what the key findings are, 
And I would argue that the more simple the slide, the easier it is to understand and therefore the more effective it is to get your message across. So a better and more clearer way of presenting data would be something like this. Now this is actually our work now, I'm not plagiarising anymore. So these are the results from our project which predict what makes fathers involved or share childcare at when the child is age three. And this is a, a more simplified table that clearly lists what the variables measure. So I have clear variable names and they're not necessarily the way that they're worded in my data set, but they're clear labels that are showing exactly uh, what they're measuring. And then next to that we have uh, the odds ratios. Now the odds ratios which are significant have been highlighted in purple because these are the results that are, that are of interest that I want to direct the audience to. It's usual practice to um, asterisk significant results. You probably already know that. Um, and we have a, a, a key here um, denoting what those stars mean. So you can see that the amount of numbers in the table is limited. It's not busy, it's not difficult read, to read and it actually makes it easier for you as a presenter to actually go through this with, with the audience as well. So as I said, these are odds ratios and basically in a nutshell, so the, the model is trying to predict whether fathers share childcare at age three. If the numbers are one or above, it means the father's more likely to share childcare at age three. If the numbers are less than one, it means the fathers are less likely to share childcare at age three. So this table basically shows very quickly that fathers are more likely to share childcare at age three if they share childcare at nine months, if the father works shorter full-time hours, if the mother works full-time, if the dad is um, not a managerial, in a managerial professional position, if the dad, oh, um, if the dad has um, more egalitarian gender role attitudes by agreeing that, disagreeing that children suffer if the mother works before they start school, etc. Age um, and other children outside the household, they're not significant, so um, there's no need to dwell on that. You could sort of mention it if there's time, but um, there's no need to dwell on that. Um, so then when I, when I present this data, I always present the second model. Now, the only variables to have changed really in this model are the ones that have been highlighted. And this is because I want to direct attention towards here. So while the previous model used employment hours at nine months to predict father involvement at age three, this model is now using employment hours at age three to predict father involvement at age three, so like current employment hours. So this time we can see that dads are more likely to share childcare at age three when, again, when they work um, standard full-time hours, when they share childcare, when the child is aged nine months. But this time, the strongest effect is actually the mother's employment hours. And you can see that fathers are about seven times more likely to share childcare at age three when the mother works full time. There's no need to scrutinise every other odds ratio in here because we've already done that. I'm just interested in, in the highlighted box there. Once the models have been presented, it's a good idea to um, summarise the key headline findings into bullet points to clarify the main take home messages for the audience. So we just presented them with you with a load of data Let's summarise this into clear, succinct and interesting statements. Um, sorry. So we'll start with our um, original question and then we have our, our statements, our take home messages from the analysis. Okay, just, um, just, just sort of as a, um, a second thing, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the qualitative research that we have been doing to complement the quantitative analysis. So our, the wider ESRC project that, that Colette mentioned before um, builds on that analysis that I've just presented to you. And we're now conducting a longer, longitudinal analysis of father involvement, now using five sweeps of data from the Millennium Cohort Study. So as, as Colette said, from, as children aged from nine months to 11 years old. And one of the aims of this project now is to develop a measure or measures of paternal involvement over time as the child 
ages from nine months to 11 years old. So we have approximately 30 different variables that measure different childcare activities that span the five sweeps of data or the five ages of child. And we're currently working on trying to reduce these 30 variables into a smaller set of measures. Our aim or our hope is to derive perhaps five measures of involvement to correspond to the five sweeps of data or the five ages of child. So we will have five rather than 30 measures of paternal involvement. We're doing this through a technique called factor analysis, but that's basically what that does. So this will allow us to track paternal involvement and what influences it as a child gets older. However, using quantitative data to measure paternal involvement in childcare has its limitations because we are essentially restricted by what is available in the data set. And one way of addressing or exploring this is to do some qualitative work to actually speak to some dads themselves about the variables that we're using to measure involvement in terms of whether these measures, whether these variables capture paternal involvement or whether there are other core activities that are not captured by these variables. And then we can use that information to assess the validity of the measures that we have produced from, from our data. So, this, so the purpose of this qualitative work is to corroborate or evaluate the quantitative measures of paternal involvement in childcare from the Millennium Cohort Study. And this work is, is actually being led by Laura, Laura Watt. So we're going to be doing 30 qualitative interviews with fathers from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds. Dads have been recruited from primary schools within across the across Greater Manchester. And with permission from the schools, Laura has been approaching parents, dropping off their children or collecting their children from the school gates to see if they'll, that they'll be interested in being interviewed. For the interview, we, we wrote down all 30 variables onto cards. The 30 variables measuring different childcare activities at different ages onto cards. And we asked dads to sort them into categories of things fathers do with or for their children because this is a bit of a clearer way of describing the task rather than saying organize this according to paternal involvement it's just a more accessible easier to understand way fathers were also asked if there were any core child care activities that they thought were missing from the variables and they were also asked you know how how they would define what being an involved father is what the, what that means to them to date, we've done 22 interviews, <clears throat> and initial results show that actually the fathers are grouping the childcare activities in very different ways, no, no, not just according to the, to the age of the child. Um, one a popular way in which fathers are grouping the, the variables is actually according to the category of the activity, so for instance, educational activities, play or care. Fathers also identified activities, some activities that were missing from the cards, so most notably teaching of values and emotional care, which was quite interesting because traditionally that's always associated with sort of the mother, mother's role, but the dads were saying that's an important aspect of fathering as well. So this work with the dads is suggesting that actually organising the variables into a measure according to the age of the child, which is what we'd like to do, is not the only way of capturing involvement. And we should actually explore alternative ways of deriving the measure, which is what we are doing. However, we also need to be wary of the sample from which these findings are based. So we're using um, information gleaned from 30 dads living in Greater Manchester to corroborate a measure of involvement that is being derived for, in this particular analysis, over 6,000 fathers in the UK. Um, we may have very different responses if we were to interview dads from rural areas, from different urban areas. And plus, we also need to think about the types of dads that are coming forward to be interviewed about their involvement in childcare. These are the dads that are bringing their kids to school and they're willing to come and talk about their involvement. So it's not going to capture the dads that are perhaps less involved in that way. So our sample isn't representative um, of all dads across the UK. So we do need to be wary about that um, when, when we're analysing the results. So just to summarise... Um, so as Colette 
said um, at the start of the talk about building a partnership with an external organisation for this project. It's, you know, it's, re it's really useful for helping you to achieve impact in your research, but you must think carefully about who you want to partner, the reasons for this, and ensure your ideas are interesting, succinct, tap into key uh, topical debates, and, and be flexible with your ideas. Be prepared to refine and adapt your project plan to build on points of connection and mutual interest with your partner. Um, we also, Claire also spoke about developing an impact plan, thinking about what contribution the study makes and why it is important. Will it help to inform policy debates, workplace innovations? Will it have beneficial uh, results for other organisations? Plan a dissemination programme for your results, with, which can be done with your partner through briefings, blogs, presentations, at other events. It's a good way to get your voice heard outside of, of academia. And when it comes to communicating your results effectively, think carefully about the audience that you are speaking to. Often the audience will be a mix of levels, different interests, different backgrounds. You need to think, try and keep your presentation accessible, clear and interesting. Busy, messy slides of complex data is just going to turn the audience off. So present data clearly and as simply as possible. Summarise key findings into headline bullet points. And then I just fi finish speaking about some qualitative research which can be used to corroborate or question quants data analysis and results. Throw up new issues you've not previously thought about or suggest new directions for your research. But this does take time. We were fortunate enough in our project that we had some money that we could employ an RA to lead on this. Um, so you, you need to factor that <coughs> into, your, into your plans as well, the time that it takes. So, and also with the qualitative work, be mindful about um, the sample on which your findings are based on. It's, you know, with, as is the case with all qualitative research, it's likely to be small. So while it can throw up new questions and ideas, think carefully about whether this can be used to, you know, really validate um, or revise findings from large scale quantitative data analysis. Thank you. Thank you.